Science in diplomacy entails the direct input of science, that is, scientific information and expertise, into diplomatic discussions and agreements, and the formulation of foreign policy. We can look at the Iran nuclear deal signed in June 2015 to see this dimension of science diplomacy. Prior to 2015, the Iranian nuclear program had resulted in sanctions that weakened its economy. While these crippling sanctions brought Iran to the table, negotiations had stalled by the middle of 2014. In 2015, after much anticipation and cautious optimism, negotiators from Iran, Russia, China, France, the UK, Germany, and the US crafted a diplomatic deal that would ensure Iran's nuclear program was peaceful and reduce sanctions against Iran. While much credit for this historic achievement goes to the foreign ministries, scientists played instrumental roles. Most visible were US Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz and Dr. Ali Akbar Salehi, the head of Iran's Atomic Energy Organization. The two nuclear physicists became number two negotiators and atomic diplomats during the nuclear talks. The fact that both were scientists enabled them to communicate in technical terms, to speak the universal language that Dr. Stone mentioned earlier. Not only that, both had studied at MIT. Discussions between the two scientists moved the talks forward on the technical issues related to Iran's nuclear program, even when political obstacles appeared insurmountable. Another important example of science in diplomacy is the use of scientific information in formulating the global agreement on climate change. In diplomatic agreements, specific benchmarks must be established in order for policymakers to outline goals and mark progress. In many cases, science helps to determine these benchmarks. Climate change mitigation requires specific, quantitative measurements for tracking a country's carbon emissions and also specific quantitative measurements for observing the effects on global climate. The signatories of the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change pledged themselves to the goal of keeping the change in the Earth's temperature under two degrees Celsius. Scientific information is also essential when we're talking about regulating and managing things like fishing outside of national jurisdictions. I'm trained as a lawyer but have always been fascinated by science and the oceans. So I've tried to combine those three into looking for the dark holes of ocean law, things that were not governed, and then trying to use the best available science to profile the issues, and then use the science to try to identify the uh, common understandings, reason for action, and potential pathways forward did that with respect to deep sea bottom fishing. That's where nations were using very heavy trawl gears that were essentially clear cutting the seabed. And most of the ocean at that point was not covered by regional fisheries management organizations with the capacity to manage this type of fisheries. So we brought that to the attention of governments at the Convention on Biological Diversity, brought it to the attention of governments at the United Nations, and eventually, uh, in 2006, they did adopt a resolution that said states and RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, are supposed to cooperate to develop rules to govern this type of fishing. So they had to form new regional, seas, fish, regional fisheries management organizations and they have to manage it to prevent significant adverse impacts. So that's a way of bringing scientific information to global rulemaking bodies that then help to set the standards. We can see from Dr. Gerdes' work that science in diplomacy brings scientific information to bear in situations that do not fall under traditional diplomatic structures. In this example, the fish she refers to are what's called a transboundary resource. They originate in one country but can cross borders and therefore involve other nations. Another example of a transboundary resource would be the water in a river that flows through several countries. Although each part of the river is inside a nation, it moves between them and therefore must be regulated and shared in common. For example, pollution or overuse in one area of the river can affect every other area. 
Science diplomacy, as you can imagine, is key for crafting fair water sharing agreements. To recap, we've discussed in detail three dimensions of science diplomacy. These are one, science for diplomacy, two, diplomacy for science, and three, science in diplomacy. But of course, these dimensions overlap, and that's what we'll talk about next.